thank you that you have saved us and made us capable of understanding the scriptures through the help of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and for all that he has done for us. Help us, Lord, as we study the scriptures to, uh, to learn the things that you want us to learn for our edification and for your glory. And I pray that your blessings would be upon your people who are watching. Help them to learn, help them to understand and be edified. And if there's any unsaved person watching this Bible study, I pray, Lord, that you would help such a person to trust Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we've been studying about the end times and we are taking a look at an overview. We are having an overview of the end times. What this is, is that we are just looking at the things that the Bible says are going to take place in the coming days. So if you take a look at this board, you will see that very soon the church is going to be raptured. The Bible says uh, that we are living in the last days. This is where we are living. We are living in the last days. Then that is the last days of the church, not the last days of the world. The last days which Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So that is the last days we are living in, the last days of the church, characterized by uh, apostasy and lukewarmness and an increase in wickedness and iniquity and all those things. And we have seen already that the signs that would uh, take place here in the tribulation have already begun and we can already see a shadow of those signs taking place right here in the church age that we are living in. In the church age. And this would be the tribulation. The seven years of tribulation that the Bible talks about, also called the time of Jacob's trouble. And this would be, as we have seen, three and a half years, the first part, and three and a half years would be the second part. That's how the tribulation is divided. And we have seen that the next great event in God's calendar would be the rapture of the church, and after that, the events recorded in Matthew chapter 24 would take place here in the tribulation. Please do remember that Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are talking about this period called the tribulation. They have nothing to do with the church age. A lot of Christians read Matthew 24 and apply it to the Christian in the church age and get totally messed up and confused in their doctrine. So in Matthew 24, we have seen that Jesus Christ clearly divides the tribulation into two parts. He says the first part is the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. And the second part is called the great tribulation great tribulation we have seen the things that take place in the first part of the tribulation in the beginning of sorrows and we have also seen what happens in the great tribulation in the middle from the middle of the seven year period to the end of the seven year period now, this is also the time when the Antichrist would be on the earth with the false prophet and people would be forced to take the mark of the beast and unless they take the mark of the beast or the number of the beast or the number of his name, they would not be able to buy or sell. It's going to be a terrible time. And we have also seen that in the middle of the tribulation, there is something called the abomination. The abomination of desolation. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. Sometime... Uh, at, uh, at the time of the mid-tribulation rapture, coinciding with the mid-tribulation rapture, with the uh, rapture would be the beginning of the abomination of desolation. And we have seen what the abomination of desolation is. It is uh, the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God and probably his image also would be there to represent him when he's not sitting in the temple. And the human sacrifices would be offered to the Antichrist and to his image. And there, and cannibalism 
uh, would also uh, be engaged in by the Antichrist. So that is the abomination of desolation. And you can do a bit of your own study on the subject from the King James Bible and uh, you will understand much better as to why we say that the Antichrist would engage in cannibalism uh, and that what, uh, is, is what is the abomination of desolation. So you have the beginning of sorrows and then you have the great tribulation in which we have seen that there would be persecution, many would be offended and they would betray one another, they would hate one another since uh, iniquity uh, would increase, the love of many will wax cold and uh, there would be uh, you know, a need for those who are in this tribulation to endure unto the end. If they do not endure unto the end, they will not be saved. So <clears throat> salvation, salvation in the tribulation is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and works. Unless people endure unto the end, this is uh, Matthew 24, verse 13. Unless people endure unto the end, they will not be saved. And the reason for that is they may profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the tribulation, but since the church is caught up and the dispensation is slowly changing from the church age to the millennial reign of Christ, the plan of salvation also changes and the way God deals with the saved also changes. For example, here in the church age, we are saved by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith plus nothing. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The Bible is very clear that it is by grace through faith and faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what saves us. No works. But once we are saved, then we do good works in order to glorify God, in order to please God, in order to be a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what uh, happens here. But also remember, when we are saved in this uh, new uh, church period, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. until the day of redemption. That means till the church is taken up and the dead in Christ rise and the living saints are, are, are transformed. Till then we are kept safe by the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit as Paul talks about in Ephesians. So this is something that does not take place here. Here in the church age, we are also spiritually circumcised. Spiritual circumcision that Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2. All these kind of, uh, these works of the Holy Spirit are not there in the tribulation. Sealed by the Holy Spirit, spiritual circumcision that the Spirit of God performs on us with the help of the Holy Scriptures. These things do not take place to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in the tribulation. What happens? They are saved, but they have to endure unto the end. And unless they endure unto the end of the tribulation, they will not be saved. They may profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but if they go ahead and take the number of the beast or the mark of the beast, they lose their salvation. So you see, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. This is what most Christians fail to do. What they do is they teach this false teaching that salvation is the same in the Old Testament, in the church age, in the tribulation and in the millennium. That is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm not just talking about uh, those covenant theologians who have no clue what they are talking about, but I'm talking even about so-called dispensationalists nowadays. They have no clue. They don't see, they don't understand the divisions that God has put in the scriptures. God doesn't read, uh, deal with mankind the same way in the Old Testament as he does with people here in the church age. That's very clear for anybody to see. God doesn't deal with Old Testament saints the same way he does with church age saints. God doesn't deal the same way with tribulation saints as he does with church age saints. Same thing with those who would be in the millennial reign of Christ. In the millennial reign of Christ. Here, salvation would be just by uh, works alone. Because remember, faith is the substance of things not seen. 
Jesus Christ would be on the earth, sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. People would be able to see him with their own eyes. Faith is not required there. What they have to do is obey the, uh, the, the king of kings who would be ruling the whole earth. That's what their salvation would depend upon. So, <coughs> of course, people would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that he is really God's king, or they would not believe him and therefore disobey him. But you see, the main element there for salvation is works. So you need to rightly divide the word of truth. You need to see that salvation in all the ages is not the same. In the Old Testament, salvation under the law especially was by faith and works, just as it would be in the tribulation. But once Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose up again, salvation is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. But once the church is caught up, they have to endure unto the end, as we have read in Matthew 24 and verse 13. And we have also compared these things with the book of Revelation, especially Revelation chapter 6. And we have seen how they match so perfectly the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 and the revelation given to John in Revelation chapter 6. Today we are going to look at the final events of the tribulation. We are going to talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please turn again to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And we will first read verses 23 and 24. 23 and 24. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Again, we have seen this last week, that as Israel hides in the wilderness from the wrath of the great red dragon and from the persecution of the Antichrist, God protects them, keeps them safe, takes care of them. And that's where they have to be careful because the Antichrist would try to set traps in order to lure the children of Israel into his traps and destroy them. But God warns them saying, if anyone says, go out there into the wilderness because Christ has come back, don't go there. Do not believe it. For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and they shall show signs and wonders. We also seen a little bit about that this last week. That the devil has the power to perform signs and wonders because he's the great counterfeit Jesus Christ. Verse 25, behold, I have told you before. So Jesus warns the people about the things that are coming upon the earth. He warns the Jews especially about the things that, go, that are going to take place. Verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus Christ says here in verse 27 that his coming the second advent would be like the lightning what does that mean that means that it would be a public event it would be something that all the people of the world would be able to see with their eyes uh, his coming would be the, uh, like the lightning that means he comes with a great glory with great power with great light and the whole world would be able to see when Jesus Christ comes back. So verses 26, 27 and also 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. As I have said last week, it's not a reference to the rapture of the church. It's a reference to the second coming. So now in Matthew 24, we have come to that part where Jesus Christ returns to the earth. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days so the, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. <coughs> Verse 29, if you compare it with Revelation chapter 6, you will see that they are very, very similar. If you remember in Revelation 6, by the time uh, the sixth seal is opened, you come to the end of the tribulation. We've already seen that. 
the six seals take you through the tribulation one full time and then the trumpet judgments take you from the middle of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation and the vial judgments take you from some time uh, from, uh, you know, from the time of the post-tribulation rapture to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So at least in three phases, you are taken through the events of the tribulation in the book of Revelation. Now come to Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So this coincides with Revelation 6 and the sixth seal and the end of the tribulation. Remember at the end of the tribulation, one of the main things that uh, is going to take place is that the, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So the sun will be affected the moon becomes as blood as we have read in Revelation 6 and here in Matthew 24 and verse 29 it says and the stars shall fall from heaven so the stars also are affected now you find a prophecy of this in the Old Testament I'm sure many of you are familiar with it look at Joel chapter 2 Joel chapter 2 and we'll read Verse 10, Joel 2.10 The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall with, withdraw their shining. So the stars will withdraw their shining. In Matthew 24 it says, the stars shall fall from their place. And in verse 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is, strong, he is strong that executed his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? So it's talking about the day of the Lord. Of course, the day of the Lord has many connotations to it in the scriptures. Uh, there are day, uh, you know, some periods of co uh, time called the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. But the main day of the Lord that the Bible talks about is here in the tribulation. And even the millennium, right up till the destruction of the present heaven and the earth. So here you have the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sun and the moon becoming dark and the stars withholding their shining. We know that our Pentecostal and charismatic brethren go to Acts chapter 2 where Peter is talking about the same thing that Joel has prophesied. Now this is something that you need to clearly understand brethren in order to rightly divide the word of truth. You have the prophecy of Joel. The prophecy of Joel, Joel 2.10 and in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2 you have the same prophecy that uh, Peter quotes from Joel and then of course he is talking about what happened on that day. Peter says what you see is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel that in, uh, on that day, on the day of the Lord, the sun shall uh, stop shining and the moon will become dark and the stars will stop shining, giving their light. Peter takes the whole prophecy of Joel 2 and applies it to that day when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. What these people do not understand is that Peter is offering the kingdom to the Jews. This prophecy of Joel has to do with the establishment of the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter is offering the kingdom, not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of heaven, which is to do with the day of the Lord. That's what Peter is offering the Jews in Acts chapter 2. And he says, look, this is what the prophet I, uh, Joel said that those who believe would receive the Holy Spirit and these signs will appear in the heavens and the Lord will come back and establish his kingdom. These Pentecostals do not see that 
that was only for that period of time because the Jews had rejected the offer of the kingdom. So with the offer of the kingdom, which was taken away from the Jews when they rejected the Messiah, was taken away also the gift of tongues and prophesying and visions and dreams and all those things. It was taken away because all those things have to do with the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven is to do with the Jews. And the Jews require a sign. So you need to study the scriptures and rightly understand, rightly divide the word of truth. If you don't do that, you get into all sorts of mess. They think that, oh look, Peter is quoting Joel chapter 2 and uh, so it, that same prophecy is still continuing today in the church age. No, it's not. When the Jews rejected the Messiah, finally in Acts chapter 7, we find that the Holy Spirit shifts his focus on uh, the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. And the, the base of operation is shifted also from Jerusalem to Antioch of Syria. And from there the Gentile uh, mission begins, especially under the uh, ministry of the, of the Apostle to the Gentiles, the Apostle Paul. But in Acts chapter 2, when Peter quotes Joel 2, he is, yes, he is right that if the children of Israel believed and all those signs would have taken place right then and Jesus would have returned and established his kingdom. But the Jews rejected it, you see. They don't understand that. Well, if the prophecy of Joel, chapter 2, was fulfilled completely in Acts chapter 2, then why didn't the sun become dark and the moon become dark and the stars withhold their shining? Why didn't that happen? They never think about it. They don't care, you know, they choose what they want and leave out the rest. But you need to look at the whole picture and you need to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you do that, you see that Joel 2.10 is not fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Joel 2.10 is fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Joel 2.10 and in fact Joel, the whole chapter, chapter 2, is fulfilled in at the second coming of Jesus Christ because that's when the sun becomes dark and the moon becomes as blood and the stars withhold their shining at the second advent of Jesus Christ. That also means that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Joel talks about and which Peter quoted would once again take place here in the tribulation. And at the end of the seven years, Jesus Christ comes back with all those signs in the heavens. The sun, the moon and the stars. Do you see that? I hope you are able to understand and follow what I'm saying. Especially those of you who are new to this teaching of dispensationalism in the King James Bible. I need you to really uh, be able to understand this because this is like a foundation. A foundation for you to learn the scriptures better. So... The Holy Spirit will be poured out in the tribulation and there will be once again great signs and wonders and healings and all sorts of things which the devil counterfeits to deceive people and all those things are coming upon the earth. They are going to take place here at the end of which the sun, moon and stars will be affected at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, let's go back to Matthew 24 and read verse 30. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now what is the, the, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven? Which uh, is quite difficult uh, to locate. <coughs> I tell you that the sign of the Son of Man is the cross. It's not. It's not. You know, they say that the key row alphabets in the Greek language, you know, they, they are used together to make it look like a cross. Now, that's not the sign of the Son of Man. That's also the sign supposedly that Constantine saw and in which he was commanded to conquer. Now, the sign that the Bible talks about is completely different from... Constantine's sign or the sign of the Roman Catholic Church uh, and it is given to bring Israel to repentance and belief remember that this sign 
of the Son of Man is seen in heaven in order for Israel to repent and believe in their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this sign is connected with the second coming. It, is not, uh, it does not have anything to do with the church age. Yes, we put a cross to talk about the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but that's it. We don't associate the cross uh, you know, with Jesus Christ, we don't go around wearing a cross in our necks or put up a big cross in our church. We don't do that. We don't do that. It's the Catholic Church that associates this cross with the church age in that manner, in a, in a very idolatrous manner. Uh, the sign of the Son of Man is never used in connection with the rapture of the church. Paul never talks about the sign of the Son of Man in connection to the rapture of the church. It's always in connection to Israel and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what exactly that sign is, I'm sure it is there in the scripture somewhere, but I don't know about it. A lot of great Bible teachers didn't know what that sign is. We can only make a few uh, biblical guesses. That's all we can do. But it surely will be there in the scriptures. Well, some people think it could be like a man's hand, you know, like a man's hand that you read about in 1 Kings chapter 18. Remember when Elijah prayed uh, for the rain and his servant went and looked and the cloud was like a man's hand. A lot of Bible teachers think that the, that cloud which looked like a man's hand could be the sign of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because just as Elijah prayed for that rain to come and the sign given to him was the sign of a cloud that looked like a man's fist. The second coming of Jesus Christ is also connected with rain. Now I will not go and show you all the verses. You can look them up yourselves. But the second coming of Jesus Christ uh, is connected to a latter rain. And this is a literal rain that will be there at the second coming of Christ. I will just tell you why. I will not go into the verses there. But the reason would be that there would not be any rain in the second part of the tribulation. Remember, Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, have power to stop rain. What did Elijah do when he prayed in the Old Testament? For three years, God stopped the rain. So that's a type of the things that are going to happen at the second coming. And when he prayed again, God gave him a sign. The sign was the sign of a cloud, like the uh, hand of a man. Okay, that's how uh, God showed him. And the second coming is connected to that rain because there won't be rain. The earth would be parched. There would be drought. And probably the Israelites also would uh, need that rain because they would be in the wilderness in the heat hiding from the Antichrist. And when Jesus returns, the Bible is clear that he comes back with rain. There are many verses in the Old Testament that clearly show that. So there is a latter rain that comes at the second coming of Jesus Christ. His second coming is connected to uh, the latter rain. And you can look up all those verses later. So the sign of the Son of Man, we don't know what it is, but it could be connected to a cloud. Now let me show you why I say this, not only because of Elijah's uh, prayer there, but look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Before that, let's read verse 9 as well. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up them out of their sight. You see the cloud connected with the ascension of Christ. When Christ ascended up into heaven, a cloud took him. A cloud is associated with his ascension. Now look at verse 11. Jesus <coughs> said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Just as you have seen him go up to uh, heaven, he will come back in the same way. He was taken up by a cloud when he went up. So most probably at the second coming, he would come back 
with a cloud. And just as Elijah was given the sign of a cloud, probably Israel would once again be given the sign of the Son of Man, which could be a cloud. Now, some of you might be thinking, why do we have to try and find out all these things? Well, whatever it is, it's all right. When that happens, we would know. That's not a, the attitude of a good Bible student. A good Bible student is concerned with every little detail in the scriptures. And there is a desire for him to understand everything that God has written there. I'm not saying that we will understand everything in the scriptures in this lifetime. No, we will not. But we make an effort. We make a sincere effort to understand every little detail in the scripture. And if you do not have this all-consuming desire inside your heart to know everything that God has put there in the scriptures, well, you something really wrong with your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't go off saying I'm judging you and all those kind of things uh, when you don't know what the Bible says about judging. Yes, a spiritual man judgeth all things. So, as, as born-again Christians, we are called to judge certain things when people do us uh, uh, wrong when people do not have the right attitude we can tell them there's nothing wrong in that so you need to understand this brethren that the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is associated with a sign and the sign could be the sign of a cloud all right so let's go back to Matthew 24 and move forward verse 31 and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this uh, verse is talking about the actual second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's somewhere there in the heaven and his sign has already appeared and then he sends his angels to gather his elect from the four four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This most probably could be a reference to the post-tribulation rapture that we have been talking about. That is Matthew 24 and verse 31. Matthew 24, 31 could be a reference to the post-tribulation rapture because his angels go out with the sound of a trumpet and they gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So that's why we say that the post-tribulation rapture is at some point very, very close to the second coming. Very close. I know I really don't know how close. I can only guess and I made my guesses known to you already in the previous Bible studies. But it is very close. Jesus is coming down and he sends his angels to, to gather. His sign has already appeared on the earth. And in other verses, we see that uh, the people of the earth are already mourning even before they see Jesus. When they see the sign of the Son of Man, they begin to mourn. You will read about it in Zechariah, uh, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12 to 14. And there, the people of the earth are mourning. There is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And the angels come and gather the elect of God. So you see, this verse is nothing, has nothing to do with the rapture of the church. This is one of the biggest heresies taught by so-called evangelical Christians, even very conservative Christians. I know some Baptist people who teach that Matthew 24, 31 is talking about the rapture of the church. Do you know why they do that? Because these good people believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church like we do. But the problem with them is, every time they find a rapture in the Bible, they, they twist the scriptures to make it look like it is the pre-tribulation rapture. It is not. That's where rightly dividing the word of truth comes in. That's where being a Bible believer helps you so much. Because a Bible believer will not twist scripture, will not go to Greek and Hebrew to make the scriptures teach what he believes. No, you don't do that. You change your beliefs according to what the Bible says. You don't rest the scriptures to suit your beliefs. You would be a heretic if you do that. So they see that there is a rapture mentioned in connection to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But they do not believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Why? Because 
in previous times it was uh, uh, the post-trip rapture people who have been proven to be wrong by great Bible teachers. So they think there is no post-tribulation rapture at all. What they don't understand is that there is a pre-tribulation rapture for the church and a post-tribulation rapture for Israel. Why don't they see that? And instead of seeing that, they try to make every rapture in the Bible the rapture of the church, which takes place before the tribulation begins. Now that is wrongly dividing the word of truth. If you rightly divide the word of truth, you leave every doctrine in its place and apply it to the right group of people in the correct period of time. So in Matthew 24, 31, there is a rapture. The angels go and they gather the elect together. But that, that is not a reference to the church age Christians. That's a reference to the elect of God in the tribulation. You will uh, read about it in uh, Revelation chapter 7. You see a great multitude of people who have come out of great tribulation up there in heaven. Where have they come from? They've been raptured. They have been raptured. That's why they are in heaven. Because Revelation chapter 7, remember, you have come to the end of the tribulation. In Revelation 6, six seals have been opened. The sixth seal brings you to the end of the tribulation. Revelation 7 is describing events that take place in heaven at the time of the second advent. So there is a post-tribulation rapture. In fact, uh, in verse 36 and verse 42 and verse 44 of Matthew 24 Jesus is referring to this event the post-tribulation rapture once again these Christians look at verse 36 verse 42 and verse 44 and apply it to the rapture of the church they say oh look what Jesus said but of the day and hour no one knows nobody knows for the rapture of the church Jesus is not even talking about the rapture of the church He's talking about the post-tribulation rapture mentioned in verse 31. I'm sure that that much is clear to you. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now the reason why some Christians apply this to the church age rapture is because remember what Paul says in Thessalonians. Even with the rapture of the church there is the archangel and the sound of a trumpet and the rapture, the dead saints being resurrected and the living saints being caught up. It looks similar. That's why they take Matthew 24, 31 and apply it to the church age rapture. It is not. You must rightly divide the word of truth. This is taking place at the end of the great tribulation after seven years of tribulation. Not before. Not before. Uh, in verse uh, 30, we have already read that the sign of the Son of Man is there in the clouds of heaven and he comes with power and great glory. Now look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. And verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Like I've said at the second coming of Jesus Christ there will be a great mourning when they see the sign of the Son of Man. Okay, and this, remember, takes place before he comes as lightning. Even before he comes down to the earth, he sends his sign. And after this, <coughs> when the sign is given, the people of the earth mourn. And then he sends in his angels to gather his elect. That's the order of events in... Uh, the tribulation very close to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this morning is also mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 1. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Because, uh, Behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. 
and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So the Jews and Gentiles alike <coughs> will see him and mourn for him at the second coming. So you see, brethren, in this uh, passage that we have read so far, that we have studied so far in Matthew 24, we are given a complete overview of the end times. Now, it doesn't end there. We are going to continue, the Lord willing. But Jesus begins from the time of the rapture of the church and he brings us in Matthew 24 to the end of the tribulation and to the second coming uh, itself, to the second advent itself. Now, this second coming would be a glorious, glorious appearing. If you read uh, in Revelation, Revelation, let's turn to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Look at what the Bible says here. We'll begin at verse 11. Revelation 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. I want you to see that. He's coming back for judgment and war. The world seeks war. The world is uh, 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 always mongering for war and that's what the Lord Jesus Christ gives them when he comes back. This war of course is called in the Bible Armageddon. Armageddon. I'm sure you've heard of this and uh, a lot of things have been taught by Bible teachers on this subject. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 19 will continue. He comes to judge and to make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. His name is called the word of God. Notice that if you have a King James Bible, the word of God is spelled with an uppercase W. The word word is spelled with an uppercase W. It's always a reference to Jesus Christ. The Bible never refers to itself with a capital W. Never. Okay, don't make that mistake. It, you know, it uh, does matter. This little detail does matter. Whenever you write the word of God, if you're talking about the Bible, the written word of God, then you write it with a lowercase w. But if you're referring to the incarnate word, then you always write that word with a capital or uppercase w. So he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And that blood in which his vesture is dipped is certainly not his own blood which he shed on the cross when he came the first time. It's not his blood. The blood in which his vesture is dipped is the blood of his enemies. It's the blood of his enemies. Because he comes to make war. Look at uh, verse 13. Verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now the armies, look at plural armies there because there are at least two armies following the Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming. One would be the army of the saved Jews of the Old Testament and the second one would be the army of saints saved in the church age and you can read about this in Song of Solomon chapter 6 and you will see the reference to the two companies, two armies. All right, so that's why it's the plural armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean that'll be you and me as well brethren we we are there in in that group and we will come back with the lord jesus christ if we are born again christians today and we'll be riding on white horses wearing these white and clean linen clothes and following our captain down to the earth what a wonderful moment that would be for us the same world which hated us, which persecuted us, which hated our Lord Jesus Christ and put him to death, rejected him, 
blasphemed his holy name for thousands of years, the same world will have to bow down before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and confess that he is Lord. Because when he comes back, he's not coming as the meek and lowly Jesus Christ. He's not coming back to wear a crown of thorns. You see, he's not going to come riding lowly and meekly upon uh, uh, an ass, the colt of an ass. No, he's coming back on a white horse. He's crowned with many crowns and he's glorious in his appearing. And he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's not coming back as the Lamb of God. He's coming back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming back as a military dictator. You need to uh, acknowledge that. You need to understand that. He's not coming just to request people to enter his kingdom. Those who are not worthy to enter into this kingdom that he's going to establish will be cast into the lake of fire. Or at least they would uh, be forced to obey him here in the millennium. They would be forced to obey him because he's going to be a military dictator. That's how he's coming back. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now look at verse 14. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. That's what he's going to do when he comes back. He's going to tread the, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63. Verses 1 following. Look at Isaiah 63. We begin at verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the strength of his, uh, tra traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered there there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. This is your meek and lowly Jesus that the Bible is describing here in Isaiah 63. He says, Boy, I'm going to kill these people. I'm going to tread them down in my fury. He's going to trample them like they are insects under his feet. That's what the Bible says. That's what he's going to do when he comes back. He's going to tread them down in his anger. In Revelation chapter 19 once again. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now it says here that uh, he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. Don't think that Jesus Christ has a tattoo on his thigh. No, it's not a tattoo on his thigh at all. He forbids all forms of tattoos, right? So, well, even if he puts his mark on us, that won't be the same as a tattoo, I know. But this most probably, this name written on the thigh is written on his vesture. On that place where it would rest on his thigh. Not really on his flesh. Most probably that's how it's going to be. But the name that is written is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a glorious appearing it will be, brethren, when he comes back a second time to the earth. He's going to subdue the nations of the earth by war. And he's going to judge them as we will study about in Matthew 25. So when he comes back, there will be Armageddon. 
war of Armageddon. Look at verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and born both small and great and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet and which that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the, the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is what's going to happen at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's going to be a war at Armageddon and Jesus Christ is going to kill all the people in the Antichrist army. And he's going to take the Antichrist and the false prophet and put them into a, uh, the lake of fire burning with brimstone. They are not sent into hell, you see. They are sent straight into the lake of fire and that's where they will be. But the devil is bound and he is uh, sent to hell or into the bottomless pit for a thousand years at the second coming of Jesus Christ. As you will read in, Matthew, uh, in Revelation 20. But the Antichrist and the false prophet are sent straight to the lake of fire and the devil joins them at the end of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Revelation 19, we are specifically told that at the second coming of Jesus Christ, there will be war and there will be judgment. And he's going to destroy his enemies, the armies of the Antichrist. He's going to tread them under his feet and he's going to kill them all. And then the Bible says there will be the judgment of the nations, which we will study the Lord willing in the coming weeks. What the Bible says about the judgment of the nations. But before we do that, we need to go back to Matthew 24 and finish the rest of the chapter. Because there, starting from verse 32, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us signs for his second coming. And we are going to consider some of those signs for the second coming. And then we'll talk about the, the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25 and finish with an overview of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that this Bible study has been a blessing to you. Uh, my intention is for you to grasp some of the most basic things regarding the end times because so many Bible teachers teach on this subject and you see that most of them do not rightly divide the word of truth and the result is great confusion. The kind of questions I get from Christians is what uh, has uh, you know given uh, rise to this desire in me to teach this subject a very basic overview of the end times because the questions that come from Christians really surprise me they ask me questions which you know they should know the answers to already but they don't and that's because they say well this preacher said this then another preacher said this about the scripture now I'm confused some of them think there is no pre-tribulation rapture. Some of them think, you know, that the whole world will be one to the Lord Jesus Christ by the gospel and then he comes back to the earth. All sorts of misunderstandings. That's why it's important to get a clear understanding, a clear picture of the end times. And once you do that, then you can fill in the flesh. This is just like the skeleton. And you do your own study and fill in the flesh and get the details prayerfully studying the scriptures and you will see it will be such a blessing to learn some of these things by yourself as you pray and depend on the Holy Spirit to open up the scriptures to you and help you understand you would see that there would be great joy in learning the scriptures in that manner once you have the framework or once you have the roadmap the correct uh, you know overview of the end times then you can fill in all the other details by yourself and study well, we have seen that the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be a glorious event. I know I'm going to be with him when I come back, when he comes back to the earth. I know I'll be riding on one of those white horses there. But are you sure that you're going to come back with him? 
I know I'll be raptured when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into midair for the church. And I know for sure because I know whom I have believed in. I have not believed my own righteousness to save me. I have not believed in my good works to save me. I have not believed in my morality to save me. I don't trust my own righteousness. I know I'm a sinner. And I know that in my uh, own uh, righteousness, I would never be able to stand before God. I would never be able to make it to heaven. That's why I trusted Jesus Christ as my savior. I know that he died on the cross for my sins. I know that when he died there on the cross, he shed his blood for my sins. And when I trusted in him, his blood cleansed me from all my sins and unrighteousness. And he was buried and he rose up again. And I prayed one day and asked him to save my soul. I cried out to him and told him that I trust him. And I know that moment I was born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I know where I'm going when the church is raptured. I'm going straight to heaven. And I'm going to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ on a white horse. What about you? It may sound to you like I'm crazy when I tell you these things, but this is what the Bible says. This is what this book says, and this is what I believe. Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? You can do that right now. You can do it right now even as you listen to this Bible study. If you know that you're a sinner, that you're going to go to hell when you die in your sins, and if you know that Jesus has died on the cross for the sins of all mankind, you have enough knowledge there to save your soul for eternity. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died for your sins. For you particular, that he shed his blood for the remission of your sins. And that he, was, that he died, he was buried and he rose up again. That's all you need to trust him, to be saved. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all you need to do. You need to trust him as your savior. You need to believe that he did all this for you in your place. In your stead that he paid the penalty for your sins that he was your substitute upon the cross when you believe that and in his resurrection you will be saved saved by faith and faith alone in the person in the blood in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ I pray that you would pray right now and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior and you trust him as your Savior right now God bless you well we are going to Continue with the sermon in about five minutes. So once again, like always, I'm going to request you to switch off the stream. And then uh, when you get the notification for the sermon, then you join us for the live streaming of the sermon. God bless you.